claim it is time to speak. Uh, if you look at uh, the kind of people we have around in the group uh, on the specific title, what uh, we have uh, in the World Immunization Week, we normally celebrate week because I think uh, we need sustained uh, remembrance that how important immunization is because uh, vaccines per se, if you see, uh, they mandate, uh, the, always vaccine mandates have got uh, to support the public health. And how do they do that is by providing protection against a particular disease. But these uh, mandates have of late sparked significant controversies uh, when they're required as part of public health policy. Because one of uh, often discussed issue, uh, discussed issue uh, usually involves multiple pathways to immunity. Because as immunologists, you understand that it's not one way that immunity works. Uh, especially now when vaccine-induced immunity and natural immunity uh, following infection are discussed, I think there's a lot of debate that ensues because some of us believe in uh, vaccine-induced and some believe in natural immunity, but there is a balance because both methods, uh, though they provide definitely a certain level of immunization, they do create substantially different concerns for policymakers because for immunization to be sustainable, the policy is very important in our country and uh, substantially uh, different risks for the individual as uh, you know, natural immunity requires uh, active infection to take place, uh, whereas uh, passive immunization normally doesn't, but their contrast should be considered, uh, you know, uh, in, in medically basically, because what is the relative protection offered by each pathway has to be taken into consideration. Otherwise what happens, we are playing in the dark uh, at the same time, the contrast uh, exists. We have to look at a larger uh, debate, which should ensue. I think that these kind of platforms are doing that. Uh, they to address some of the practical logistical issues when applying immunization requirements to public policy. Um, I can think of three things uh, when we're talking about. I always have some numbers to talk about. One, two, three. The first one is the risk exposure. Now. Each pathway to immunity exposes individuals to different levels of risk, be it uh, active infection or passive immunization. Passive immunization, again, it could have killed or versus through a vector. So all these things have got their own benefits and risks involved. So people could have adverse reactions <coughs> to vaccines uh, or severe outcomes could also come due to an infection. So which one do you look at? What is the risk benefit ratio? Is it the vaccines are better or the active infection? So risk becomes the cornerstone for making public health policy decisions uh, because naturally everybody would say vaccine is safe or bad because it's only adverse events which we can deal with rather than uh, looking at a, a complication that arises due to infection such as COVID, uh, which was uh, an outcome of SARS-CoV-2 infection and the disease is uh, much prolonged and has a lot of collateral damage which has been done. The second factor we need to look at is the reliability of the method we have because uh, vaccination uses very systematically the same formulation each time, and it has got set doses at exactly when the dose has to be given, and there is a way to measure the antibody levels or the cellular immunity levels. We've got all these methodologies. So it's a systematic project where we can follow up an individual from the beginning of a, a immunization till the closure. But natural immunity is highly variable because you cannot compare between two individuals the intensity of the infection to measure the outcome, how much is required to be exposed as natural immunity. So people may not know also <clears throat> which strain has infected them. Uh, we were all debating whether it is Omicron or Delta. In my own family, we had uh, SARS-CoV, all six of us infected. My dad uh, recovered just less than 24 hours, though he was positive, when I took almost a week to recover. So I do not know whether mine was a Delta Omicron mixture or was it only Omicron. Uh, because in a natural immunity, you cannot really differentiate this. So people may not know which, uh, these information. So natural immunity automatically takes a little sideline when we're talking by uh, the, the scale of uh, immunization which are structure. And the third point is sustainability. The public health uh, policies must consider the requirements to sustain immunity for a long period of time among many populations. 
each immunization protocols which you have done so far in the country or abroad, anywhere in the world, is always focused on you know, sustained uh, measurements for any antibody levels or the level of immunity. But so in a vaccine, tracking an Im induced immunity becomes quite simple because everything is structured. We can decide when to give a booster dose, uh, and you know when to stop everything, but in a natural immunity, that is the uh, drawback. But many a times we do not know when a lot of asymptomatic people got infected either. So we do not know how much antibody levels are there and should we protect them now or should we give them the booster dose later? Even now for COVID debate is on, which says maybe we should give them a second dose or a booster dose or not because every protein in this uh, virus has been exposed to the immune system when it was replicated. So in principle, the body should have produced antibodies for every protein during its evolution, uh, during its uh, formation, not evolution, during its formation. So body should be strongly protecting against this virus. But we see every variant it is hitting again, which means even slight variation in the virus also cannot protect. So sustained uh, you know, uh, approach is very important when you're looking at vaccines as a means which is more favored. So in, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, all three factors, you know, the risk, benefit ratio, uh, the exposure and sustainability, are all three are important to support building public health policy on vaccines, uh, which I believe is the safest option. But ultimately, policy may need to be uh, considering both vaccine-induced and natural immunity following infection, but ultimately, any one option has to be chosen. We cannot clearly settle the scientific debates on this point uh, since we lack clear and convincing scientific evidence that only vaccine-induced immunity has significantly higher protective effect than natural immunity. So there are two schools of thoughts. That's why anti-vaxxers are going uh, no vaccine, no vaccine. But when we are in situations such as a pandemic, I think we need to take a concrete call from policy perspective and uh, decide on vaccination because vaccines do represent a better option uh, around which to coordinate boosters and ensure continuing immunity. So both have their advantages. And based on the situation, each country that is exposed to, we need to make choose one or the other. So that's the principle of what I would like to say. Uh, and with this, I wish all the very best to everyone who is on uh, this program. And I wish that you all benefit from this conversation we are having here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Manish. Much appreciated. It's a good way to get us starting to think on uh, not just the routine immunization, where the coverage that we are having in this country really needs boosting up. And it is not just up to one organization to be doing that. It is up to all of us as healthcare professionals to be putting our shoulder to the same wheel. And now, thanks to this uh, uh, school of thought that you have kind of exposed us to, it will be a good way to take it forward. So thanks very much, and thanks for making the time. Much appreciated. Absolutely stunning to have a young professional calling up, I mean, coming upon uh, to be talking more about what is the IPA-SF and also what is IPA-CPD. But more important, what it also shows is how can we as healthcare professionals start contributing to our universal immunization program where for the routine immunization when the coverage is so low, what is it that we could be doing as healthcare professionals? So Vrishali, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind words, ma'am. Uh, I think I have a presentation to present. Such. Thank you so much, Kaj. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the World Immunization Week webinar, which is conducted between 24th to 30th April. Before anything, let me introduce myself. My name is Rishali Doshi, and I'm a fourth year family student at Party with Pune College of Pharmacy. I am currently the editorial head at the IPSF Pune chapter and the chairperson of projects for the IPA steering committee of 2022. Next slide, please, Kaj. So this is just, just about me. Moving on. Next slide, please.
a little bit about the Indian Pharmaceutical Association. It is one of the most oldest pharmaceutical professional organizations in India, established way back in 1939 in Banaras Hindu University. We now operate through 20 state branches with more than 46 local branches. The IPA works under five main divisions, that is the industry, hospital, education, regulatory affairs, and community. Or you can know more about all these divisions on our website at www.ipfarma.org. Next slide, please, Raj. So uh, what exactly is IPA is that it is a national body representing over 1 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists from various industries like academia, regulatory, hospital, and community who come together to meet India's healthcare needs. IPA is a non-governmental organization that has official relationships with the International Pharmaceutical Federation and World Health Organization. And now we just have 80 years of advancing pharmacy profession nationwide. Moving on a little bit about the IPA Community Pharmacy Division, which you can see on the next slide, yes. So it is a young division of the IPA and it was created in 1996 to make the pharmacists a little bit more aware of their role in the community. The IPCPD aims to enhance the role of a pharmacist and raise professional standards of pharmacy practice through activities and aims to provide the public health through community pharmacy services. Uh, next slide. Most of our projects and activities revolve around development and advancement of community pharmacy, uh, improving pharmacy service and pharmaceutical care and patient welfare. Some of our partners include uh, the FIP, that is the International Pharmaceutical Federation, PCI, SCR Farm Forum, Abbott, Pfizer, GSK, and so many more. Moving on. Uh, next slide, please. A little huh? bit about IPSF. You go You are in first group only. A little bit about the IPSF. Okay. Uh, next slide. It is a group of young motivated pharmacists and pharmaceutical graduates who work within the IPA. The group was officially established in 2008 and our objective is to facilitate connections and networking so that new ideas are shared, doors of information are open and there are lots of new and exciting possibilities. Moving on, uh, most of our um, uh, IPSF members are uh, from Maharashtra, that is nearly 2,000 members, and the IPSF widespread in around 15 states with 5,000 members. Moving on. Just a little bit about the webinar, which is about the World Immunization Week, and the theme for 2022 is Long Life for All. So the World Immunization Week is celebrated in the last week of April and aims to highlight the collective action needed and to promote the use of vaccines to protect people of all ages against diseases. And the ultimate goal of this week is for more people and their communities to be protected from a vaccine and preventable diseases. Thank you so much for the opportunity and all the best to all the speakers there. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Ms. Rani. Much appreciated for giving us an overview of what the organization does and what, as youngsters, you're all doing. Thanks a lot, Vishali. Much appreciated. Thank you, ma'am. I wish you all the best. Uh, yeah, with all the endeavors. So next we have Dr. Mishba. Uh, Dr. Mishba represents the World Health Organization, and who better to ask for to give us an overview of what is happening and where should we, as the next generation leaders, be focusing on? So, Dr. Mishba, thank you for making time, and over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, just give me a moment to share my screen. Could the rest of you please mute yourselves and allow the speaker to carry on? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, am I audible? And my screen uh, visible? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. So I think first I'd like to thank um, 
uh, yourself, Dr. Sunita, ma'am. I think she gave me the opportunity to speak on World Immunization Week. I think which is also very um, close to my heart when it comes to immunization. I have been working with WHO since last 10 years uh, in this field of immunization and uh, I have got opportunity to work in various states uh, starting from Uttar Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, the NCR region and now in my hometown Karnataka. So I will just try to give a little brief on you know, some questions we may all be having as health uh, workers or healthcare professionals about vaccines and do they actually work? So during my outline of my presentation, I will just touch upon what is vaccines, will they work, childhood vaccination, effect of COVID-19, which has happened, impacted on, on the whole immunization, and what is WHO's role in maintaining vaccine equity. So how do vaccines work? So we all um, have, we know this by, you know, most of the ways, different, different ways. They help in reducing the risk. I think Dr. Manish started out well in the starting the risk of exposure to diseases. They help in reducing that risk by working with your body's natural defense mechanism. So when you take a vaccine, your immune respond, immune system responds. First, it recognizes the invading germ. It could be virus or bacteria. It helps in producing the antibodies inside your body. And of course, next time it also remembers the disease and how to fight the disease if you get exposed to it. So it is a very uh, simple way of saying that it's a very safe and clever way to produce an immune response in the body without actually falling ill. Also, based, apart from the immune response, it has got a very big uh, collective social benefit. It helps in stopping disease transmission from one person to another, and thus helping the you know, social and psychological burden and financial burden, which is caused by a disease, comes down greatly. We all know that vaccines are one of the most cost-effective tools ever invented. It prevents around 3.5 to 5 million of deaths every year by uh, diseases like diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, influenza, and measles. It's one of the success stories we have seen is of smallpox, smallpox eradication in the year 1980, which even just a few decades ago, several hundred thousands people were, uh, were used to, you know, uh, succumb to the disease every year. We also know that the world is very close to polio eradication thanks to all the efforts put in by all of you during every pulse polio immunization day every year. And also the world is working towards measles and rubella elimination now. So we do know one thing, so vaccines do work. So if you look at this in a sort of way, not um, going more into the details of the graph, because of these vaccines, the deaths in children, which, can be, uh, which are caused by these vaccine preventable diseases has reduced from 1990 to uh, 2017. So almost before we used to have 5 million deaths, it's come down to 1.8 million deaths. But we still estimate one thing. Every year, even after the vaccines, which are already from past 40, 50 years into the world, we still are uh, you know, losing out 1.5 million deaths uh, in children every year still happen. And that is where we need to make sure during this World Immunization Week, we spread across the message of uh, vaccination and its importance. Now, coming to what government of India is doing, it launched an uh, expanded program for immunization way back in 1978. And the Universal Immunization Program, it was renamed as Universal Immunization Program by adding in more vaccines to its kitty in the year 1985. India is one, uh, this vaccination program, which we call as UIP, is one of the world's largest public health program. Every year in the world, every Every uh, year in the India, around uh, three crore pregnant women take vaccination from the government vaccines which are provided. And around 1.2 crore sessions are planned every year. We are also very proud to say that India is the largest manufacturer of vaccine capacity in the world. Uh, just a second, give me a second. Uh, thank you. And these are the number of diseases for which vaccines are being given by the government of uh, India. It could be 12 diseases. It could be saving from polio, uh, severe form of TB, diphtheria, pneumonia, the pertussis, measles, hepatitis B. So we have a lot of vaccines which is given free of cost by government of India. And I think my next speaker, Dr. Rajeshri, will actually be speaking more on this, what are the things which are happening in the field from the government perspective also. And this is just to show you a snapshot at which age what vaccine is given as per the schedule which is being followed in Karnataka. 
But having said this, what are the challenges we are facing? The challenges are, uh, why are we still not meeting all the uh, you know, children for vaccination? Of course, there are challenges of accessibility. A very good cold chain maintenance needs to happen in every stage, every place. Vaccine hesitancy, that is refusal for vaccination, also we have seen in some pockets and communities. Social media rumors and false information. We all have seen this during the COVID vaccination program also. And fear of any adverse event which happens after immunization. So these are some of the challenges which has stopped us from reaching our goal. But uh, the biggest thing which has happened in the last two years, which we all are going through is COVID-19 pandemic. That has put so much of burden on the health system and strained the health system that last year alone, 20, in 2020 alone, 23 million children had missed any form of vaccination. So it has uh, brought down our immunization. So this is one of the slides which I just wanted to stress upon, that this was a report by WHO and UNICEF, joint report which was released last year. It shows uh, 10 countries account for 62% of missed uh, children who have not taken vaccine of some form or the other. So in 2019, Nigeria had almost of the missed children around 3 million, followed by India. By one year of pandemic in the year 2020, India is leading this uh, group of countries with the highest uh, number of missed children. Around 3.5 million children in India still have not received the required doses. Uh, I would not be completing my talk if I don't speak a little about COVID-19 vaccines also. So we know how the vaccines, the, particularly the COVID-19 vaccines, have um, helped us to battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. The efficacies of various COVID-19 vaccines may vary, but we know one thing they do. They help in reducing severe disease, hospitalization, as well as deaths. Till now, around 10 billion vaccine doses have been administered around the world. But we still see that the access to COVID-19 vaccines is disproportionate. So we have high income countries where around 72% of the population has been vaccinated with at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. But when you compare to low income countries, only 16% have been vaccinated with at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. So we know the vast difference and the inequity which we see in the world. So it is never um, late to say that no one is safe until everyone is safe. So everyone around the world should have taken the vaccine for us for ending this COVID-19 pandemic. So in the year 2020 and 2021, uh, a global collaboration by uh, all the organizations like UNICEF, Gavi, CEPI, and WHO came together with a bigger, larger objective to reduce vaccine equity. We all know one thing, to end this global health crisis, we just don't need COVID-19 vaccine but we also need to ensure that this vaccine is available to everyone around the world. So after um, one year of its inception, the first delivery of this vaccine to low-income countries started from 24th February 2021. And so far, around 1 billion vaccine has been given through this program to 144 uh, participants or uh, countries from low-income countries. But still, uh, many countries are waiting to get COVID-19 vaccines. I think we are one of the few um, very fortunate countries where you know vaccination program launched very fast and we have done tremendously good. But there are still some countries they have not received vaccine. And still we estimate around 2.8 billion people around the world have not even got their first shot of COVID-19 vaccine. So WHO's, um, one of the WHO's campaign is for vaccine equity and it is very close to WHO's heart. So before I end my presentation, these are some of the common questions I think you, all of you who is attending uh, this webinar must be having in mind. Some point of your life, you would have come across this question. When should I get vaccinated? Or how do I take a child? Or if any child comes to you seeking for health advice, what do you tell to the child? So vaccines are there throughout our life. For childhood vaccination, I showed you some vaccines which are available by government of India. For, during pregnancy, they give vaccination. As teenagers also, we have vaccination. Even in old age, there are some vaccines. So if you get your opportunity, make sure that you get your due vaccine dose. If we delay vaccination, we are really at risk of getting any serious, to get seriously sick. And by chance, if you have missed your recommended vaccine dose, make sure that you uh, reach your nearest health facility for the same. And the second common question which comes to our mind, why should I get vaccinated? We need to understand without vaccines, we are at risk of severe illness and disability from diseases. Some of these diseases may be very, very uncommon. You must be thinking, I don't see diphtheria anymore. I don't see some of these diseases. But we need to understand these germs are always present in the world, somewhere or the other. 
and in today's uh, world it's very easy for them to cross over the borders and infect anybody so two key reasons which i would want to specify is to get vaccinated one is to protect ourselves and to protect those who are around us so having said that um i thank everyone and i would like to say that who is committed to ensuring that everyone everywhere can realize the right to good health and we will stand by this uh, for providing uh, more awareness on vaccination thank you thanks a lot dr a lot dr this is uh, an absolutely inspiring one because if we now are leading for the wrong reasons of having missed the number of vaccination for children but we also have the advantage that we are the country with the biggest uh, immunization program in the world and one of the largest sessions that we conduct in the world but more important we are also the largest manufacturers of the vaccine so as much as we can be proud of all the good things we are doing this session was extremely important in inspiring the next generation to say what are the gaps and how can the next generation start addressing those gaps now rather than when they start joining the workforce there's a lot that can happen during volunteering and all of those activities and we look forward to working with you in different ways if there are such opportunities uh, in mentoring the next generation so thank you so much for uh, giving us this uh, overview and uh, representing the who in telling us what is the way forward much appreciated uh, dr mishra thank you thank you thank you thanks and uh, so now i think you know where we can head from what dr mishra has uh, guided us with is to understand how can we contribute to this program and this is exactly where i would like to bring in the organization 3 analytics that i represent uh, where we are working with uh, two governments and we are doing our bit in supporting the governments in terms of their uh, vaccination program so we were initially working with the covid vaccination and uh, the post vaccination surveillance part of it and now we have been provided the opportunity to look at the routine immunization so we are contributing in our little ways and uh, i think you know that's that's what we each can do each of us contribute to that ocean so that at the end of the day the ocean is uh, you know the next generation because it is about pregnant women it is about uh, uh, the next generation the children and all the special populations as well so so there is a lot to be done there i think as a next step what we can do is uh, until dr rajeshwari joins us who is busy we can have a video now this particular video is from a very dear colleague uh, dr stephanie lucas she is the interim director of global health and equity education she is also an associate professor and this is in university of health and pharmacy in st louis usc what she and her colleague Uh, have done us they have recorded a video for us because of the time difference that we have her colleague is dr nicole gatis she is the director of the office of experiential education she is also a professor of pharmacy practice and both of them are from university of health and pharmacy in st louis in usa so uh, karsh if you can please play the video for us thank you joining us today I am going to briefly um intro start off with some introductions and here is our contact information if you would like to reach out and talk to us more about this topic today we'll also put it up again at the end um but it has information including our email addresses uh information about our doctor of pharmacy and masters in global health and equity programs at University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy as well as more information about where you can find out about vaccinators in the United States so i will stop sharing my screen with y'all and we will start off with some introductions so my name is Stephanie Lucas i am a pharmd and masters in public health I am a faculty member at University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy, the uh, interim director of Global Health and Equity Education, and an associate professor. I teach public health to our pharmacy students, and so I really think that vaccination is an important role for pharmacists. So I'm excited to talk with you all today, and I will introduce our um, or turn it over to our co-presenter so that she can introduce herself. This is Dr. Nicole Gaddis. 
Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for watching our video. Um, Nicole Gaddis, I have been immunizing since 1998, so a long time. Um, I also have a doctor of pharmacy degree from the University of Iowa, which is in the smack middle of the country. I did residency training in Chicago a little bit further, but still in the middle. And then I moved to St. Louis, also in the middle, but a little further south. Um, and I've been in St. Louis for since after residency, uh, all, always involved in immunization since I was in school. And um, my other roles include experiential education and helping our students get the right rotations for themselves, as well as professor of pharmacy practice. And within that role, I do teach our students the immunization training course. Um, and over this past year, well, a couple of years since COVID, I've also been involved in giving COVID vaccinations here in the US. Thank you very much for talking with us today. Um, I guess I should also say that I too uh, learned to be a vaccinator when I was in pharmacy school and then um, vaccinated in, in that relation and then um, out in, the, in some community pharmacies as well. So we're gonna start off today by talking a little bit about the history of what vaccination looks like in terms of pharmacist roles in the United States. We'll talk a little bit about um, how it looks in terms of educating our future pharmacists to become vaccinators, and then move into what is um, pharmacist roles look like in terms of improving access to COVID-19 vaccinations. So let's start off talking about some history. Um, can you give us a brief overview of the history of vaccinators as pharmacists as vaccinators in the US? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, we started vaccinated back in the 1800s against small packs in some parts of the country. But as far as all pharmacists across the country immunizing, that really started about 1996 when the American Pharmacists Association developed a training program for pharmacists that was rapidly adopted across many states. And our, our states have different laws than our national laws for pharmacist practice. And um, the organization really pushed to get laws changed so that pharmacists had the ability to provide immunizations as part of our definition of the practice of pharmacy. So in 1996 is um, actually, I would think I was trained in 1997. So the year after that came out and um, we started training a lot of different pharmacists at that time. Um, and when I came into my first position at the University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy, we offered an optional training for students. But a few years later, we started requiring that that training, the APHA training, it's called Pharmacist Based Immunization Certificate Training. And um, that is now required for all of our students and has been for about the last 10 years or so. And most colleges across the country do require it now of, of all their graduates. Um, we still have a number of practicing pharmacists that haven't completed it, but that's fewer and fewer every year. Thank you. I think that's great. I think one of the things that's, um, that you mentioned that's really interesting about the United States is the fact that we have 50 different states and each one of them has their own board of pharmacy that's making their own laws and regulations. Um, and I think that's really important for our partners in India to understand as you guys are trying to figure out how to bring pharmacists into this role. There's a lot of different examples that you might look at um, within our United States to see how it's done in different states. Um, I think that's a great opportunity for you to see, you know, some of the ways that it was maybe a little bit more accelerated and some of the states that they were a little bit slower. So it's a good opportunity if you're thinking about how do we get started to have a number of different roles to be able to look at. Um, I think one of the things that you'll find that's interesting is there's a lot of different vaccinations that pharmacists give and different states have rolled that out in different ways. Yeah, so states limit pharmacists immunizing by age. In some cases, uh, many of the states, some of them were 18 and up, some 13, 11, nine, down to three in some states. Um, and recently, nationally, they've taken away that age differentiation. Um, the other issue is which vaccines can we give? So initially, our physician, our physician friends were not wanting us to give the childhood vaccines, the ones for the very young, because they wanted to make sure those children were coming in to see the doctor. Um, but as we know, pharmacists as the most most accessible healthcare professional, we 
could see those kids anytime. Down, you know, many of our pharmacies are open until 9 p.m. every evening. And so our access point is much greater than a lot of physicians' offices, which are like nine to three, Monday through Friday. Um, so that has also opened up to where initially we could only get flu vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, um, fairly rapidly went into hepatitis uh, vaccinations. And then from there, we're now down to giving meningitis, HPV, and now the childhood vaccines as well. And then of course, in the last couple of years, giving the COVID vaccination. I think that's great. Um, I think you mentioned that pharmacists really play an important role in helping to reduce barriers in terms of access. Um, any other thoughts on why it's helpful to have pharmacists in the role of vaccinators? Yeah, absolutely, because not only are we accessible, but we know what health conditions that patients have by the medications they're filling. So if someone's filling diabetes medication, we can easily say to them, you know, you would really benefit from getting a pneumococcal vaccine. And so we can recognize those risk factors in patients and we can offer those vaccines when they come and see us every month or every couple months to get their medication. So the accessibility as well as the knowledge of their um, health conditions really combines to be a powerful force to get the public vaccinated. Great, thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, education of students. So you started to talk about that. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that becomes part of the PharmD program? Sure, um, I'm gonna actually start with the APHA pharmacy-based immunization program itself. So it is a 20 hour program. Uh, either pharmacists or students, they study for eight hours at home and they take a CE quiz when they come in. It's, it's about four chapters of in-depth immunology, information on the different vaccines, information on how to start a, a immunization program, such as marketing and how to put it in your workflow of your pharmacy even. Um, and then they come to class for an additional, um, sorry, it's 12 hours of pre-work and eight hours in the classroom. So within the uh, students curriculum, colleges have the ability to implement it however they want. So some colleges and what we used, did in the beginning is one full day, Monday from eight to five, you're gonna be in class all day long and learn everything and take your final exam. Now we're like, eh, it's just a long day. So we're now into the, we, we divvied up over four different days for our students. And some universities do it in one hour increments as well. So they would do it over a semester as part of a required course. So it's really done individually based on the university itself. But overall, all of them will have about 20 hours of education. Um, and then in addition to the knowledge component, there's a practicum component. So after they're done, getting all the knowledge, they do take a final exam for the knowledge piece, but we also practice. So we make them do the hand motions, how to do the, the vaccine itself and practice. And then they actually have to stick each other. They have to have three successful pokes of a partner with a uh, normal saline um, in order to get their certificate and pass. Great, thank you. I remember when I was in pharmacy school, that was always the thing. You always wanted to make sure that you got a good partner since you were gonna be poking each other. And it's a real person, it's not oranges. We, we wanna make sure we're practicing on each other. And I will tell you this, most of our students, many of them are, are very nervous when they start. After you do like, I'm gonna say three, after you get that third one, you're like, this is so much easier than I thought it was gonna be. It really isn't that hard. It's just sort of getting over your your jitters. Um, and and once you get past those, you know, first 10 or so, you're like, I don't even know why I was nervous. So it's very, it's it's very easy once you get started. Absolutely. I agree. And I think that um, this sort of transitions nicely into talking about pharmacists' involvement with the COVID-19 vaccine because so many of us have gotten so much more experience with vaccinations because there's been so many COVID vaccines. So do you wanna talk a little bit about um, how that's evolved in the United States? Yeah, it, well, there's been pharmacists involved in all the different levels from vaccine development to getting the vaccine into the hands of pharmacists um, to the actual giving of the vaccine. So it's really been an exciting time to be in pharmacy in the United States. Um, my particular role and what many pharmacists did was the actual administration component. So um, setting up appointments. So when we're first having the COVID vaccine out, one of the amazing things is people were lining up. There were hours long waiting. They were very excited to get the vaccine, but managing the people was actually an art in itself. 
to say, you have an appointment, it's at this time, so we try not to have, you know, 100 people in one small space when we're trying to prevent COVID from occurring. Um, so we, we vaccinated thousands of people in our clinics, and we did have a computer system that tried to get specific appointments, ask people to come at their appointment time to manage that people component. And um, we also tried to figure out and refine how many people at the intake window, making sure we're getting all the right questions answered. We need to make sure we're immunizing correctly for uh, patients with health conditions or allergies. Um, the actual immunization component, a lot of our students were involved in that as well. And then um, we did make patients wait um, for about 15 minutes post vaccination, especially with a new vaccine that they'd never been exposed to before to make sure there were um, no adverse reactions or if there were that we could handle that. Absolutely. And um, one of the things in the public health classes, we taught them earlier in the program how to manage an emergency uh, pod, as we call it, a point of dispensing. So it was a great opportunity for our students to be able to see that in person. Um, with that, we also get, give our patients educational materials. So they leave with information related to their vaccine so they know what they're getting and potential side effects, as well as um, what to do if they have a side effect. And uh, we have a reporting system in the United States that you can report your side effects to. So we sent patients home with a copy of that information. And in fact, now you can download an app uh, and make it really easy to try to make sure that we're keeping track of all of that information. Um, so I think that's another place where pharmacists in the United States are getting involved is with the government system in terms of uh, adverse reaction tracking and monitoring all of that type of things. Absolutely. And I'll say that uh, we've transitioned a bit, right? So in the beginning, we had these people clamoring to get the vaccine. And now we're at a point in the U.S. where most of those people are vaccinated and boosted. And now we're trying to talk with the patients that have vaccine hesitancy which is one of the hardest things as a pharmacist to handle and deal with. So we might be familiar with all the studies and be very pro-vaccination, and we're trying to speak with folks that have different opinions about their health in very various regards. So there are a number of trainings that have come out through pharmacist.com and other places to help pharmacists identify best ways to communicate with patients using open-ended questions, motivational interviewing to ask them things to try and encourage them in one way or the other and understand their concerns before we start lecturing them. Absolutely. That's definitely something that I think we've seen with this vaccine far more than we've seen with other vaccines. Um, and I think in the United States, this has some ramifications for some of our other vaccines. So I think figuring out how to communicate with your patients, making sure that you're alleviating their fears um, and finding some middle ground between giving them all the information that we know as pharmacists and overwhelming them, but also making sure that we're answering all of their questions. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that, you know, uh, as you're thinking about somebody who's maybe advocating for having pharmacists providing vaccinations or trying to think about how might we start some of these programs in other places. Any advice that you might give folks? I would say just start somewhere. I think it was a, it was a John Gravenstein who is actually one of our um, leaders in immunization that said pharmacists are always one more training hour away from doing anything. So get your training, get online and get some training, but then just start somewhere. And advocacy can be on multi diff multiple different levels. And like the, in the United States, it would be on a state level that would, could be most impactful or trying to work with your national organizations to push on a state level um, or a local level, because that's where you're gonna have real impact for patients, but you have to be able to do it first. So working with, within the context of your government structure and your um, legal and regulatory, um, areas within your country, understanding those well, so that you can learn how you can make changes in that to make a difference for your patients. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Well, um, we've really enjoyed talking with you all for World Immunization Week. Um, and I think that this is a topic that we could continue to talk about for quite some time. 
Uh, we, I think, are getting pretty close to our time, but are there any other final thoughts that you might want to share or any um, stories that come to mind as you're having your experience vaccinating? I have a lot of stories having done this for a long time, sure. um, but I think some of the best times is um, watching my students vaccinate my own kids. So seeing them grow and being able to know that I'm protecting my own children and I have trained the students that are helping me to protect my family too. That, that was just, that's been really special. I love that. And then once they graduate and go out to work in the community that we're now part of, seeing them vaccinate and, you know, I travel, so going out and getting my travel vaccinations and running into our pharmacists and community settings, I love that. So I think that's great. Well, thank you everyone for your time. I am going to put up our contact information again here for you. So if you have any questions, you can, oops, you can reach out to us. So um, we, I'm trying to make this full screen here so that everybody can see this a little bit bigger. There we go. So my email address, I'm Stephanie Lucas and Nicole is Nicole Gaddis. Um, you can learn more about uh, the information that we've talked about at pharmacist.com. So that has all kinds of great information on pharmacists as vaccinators. It has a whole web page just dedicated to COVID-19. So that's a great place to go. That also will have information in terms of how you might get vaccinated or how you might be educated as a future pharmacist vaccinator. So that's a great place to go. Um, if you're looking for more than just some information and potential certificate on immunization and you want some additional training, our university, University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy in St. Louis, does have a Doctor of Pharmacy as well as a Master's of Science in Global Health and Equity. You can go on our webpage, uhsp.edu, to learn more, or you can reach out to either of us by email. Thank you all very much for your time, and happy Thank World you. Immunization Work. Thank you uh, to our speakers who made it possible for them to record it and share it with us. I think one of the take take home messages from this is we have to start somewhere. And the other take home message that definitely came through very strongly is, uh, I mean, of course they spoke about pharmacists, but for me it is about any healthcare professional. For any healthcare professional, starting something is only one training away. It, it just needs us to get started and, and also make sure that the self-development that we need for that process is also in place. Now, what I would really like to highlight here is uh, the timing couldn't be much better. Uh, our uh, IPA CPD's, uh, uh, you know, uh, excellent colleague, uh, Mr. Raj Vaidya, sent this information forward to us. It's about a meeting that is taking place on uh, May, I mean, 2nd of May from 3 to 4 p.m. This is a meeting for FIP India Pharmacist Vaccination Project. They are looking at curriculum and training that is required for this. So FIP stands for International Federation of Pharmacists. So all of you young pharmacists out there, please make sure you join the organization and you support the organization because whether it is advocacy, whether it is we each becoming a strong advocate or a strong member of the vaccination program, Whatever we are looking at in terms of immunization, there's a large role to play. We have the largest immunization program in the world. We have the largest number of uh, companies producing the vaccines. So whichever way you look at it, whether it is from a pharmaceutical uh, and our technology and um, industrial uh, space, or whether you look at it from the angle of public health, there is absolute space to contribute. And also don't be shy of getting in touch with us at Three Analytics for any kind of internship opportunities that gives you the space and time to focus on some of these key aspects. So with that, I would like to invite Dr. Rajeshwari uh, to talk to us about her experiences from Karuna Trust. Dr. Rajeshwari, over to you, please. While Dr. Rajeshwari uh, gets ready and unmutes herself, uh, Dr. Rajeshwari is a medical officer at uh, Ardugodi Dispensary in Bangalore. Uh, 
uh, I have had the you know uh, opportunity to work with her on several projects and someone I really look up to uh, as an excellent leader that she is. Uh, Dr. Rajeshwari here will be representing what happens at the primary healthcare level because we couldn't have asked for a better set of speakers today where internationally we got a vision of how they have gone about it and how we can possibly think of ways that works for us to go about it in this country. We have had Dr. Mishba who spoke from a WHO perspective and showed us uh, a bird's eye view of where are we in the program, how have we fallen from being the second country in the world uh, where majority of the children are not getting the vaccination coverage that they should be getting and now we have gone to becoming the first country in the world. Now we have Dr. Rajesh who will tell us from uh, the perspectives of a primary healthcare because at the end of the day that is the last mile and that is exactly where the service delivery has to be enhanced in whichever country we talk about but mainly in a country like India and uh, Dr. Rajeshwari over to you please. Dr. Rajeshwari, are you able to unmute yourself? Hello, hello. Yes, doctor, please go ahead. Haan, Dr. Sunita, I'm Dr. Rajeshwari. Yeah, please go ahead, Dr. Rajeshwari. Yeah, yeah. I would just brief myself. Hello, is it audible? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely audible. Please go ahead. So I'm Dr. Rajeshwari working as a medical officer in Argodi Dispensary, which is one of uh, urban primary health center. Like uh, I think most of the students must be knowing uh, urban primary health center always uh, caters or takes care of ward because BBMP is always divided ward wise. So there are 195 wards in Bangalore city alone, which comes under BBMP. And so I'm taking care of ward 151. Argodi dispensary comes under ward 151, where we cater 54,146 population. The population, it's also population wise, ward wise. So it has been divided into ward and population wise. So where they are, go I'm going to take, uh, cater 54,147. Out of that, we have six urban slums. Urban slums in the sense, uh, uh, it has been categorized based on the, uh, uh, based on uh, the economic condition and uh, the way of house. Uh, is it one bedroom, bedroom house or is it a thatched house or is it is a roofed house? But now, of course, Bangalore is no, no more have uh, huts, but still, uh, the uh, slums have always been called as slums only, though there is so much of change in them. So uh, we uh, uh, we cater all this organ uh, this thing and uh, vaccination also. This since this is an immunization, I would uh, say that I would cover more of vaccination about immunization. As Dr. Mishba, she gave the complete uh, uh, details of immunization, and she is our uh, SMO also WHO where she. Uh, guides us with the vaccination for uh, routine immunization uh, prominently. Though she is always behind, uh, takes guides us in that sense. But of course, with the routine immunization, we have done the COVID vaccination also during this COVID, uh, when COVID vaccination was started in the in our country. So this was started in uh, January 16, 2021 where the first priority was healthcare workers. And subsequently, after the healthcare workers were given vaccination, simultaneously, they started with vaccination 45 years and above with comorbidities. Comorbidities in the sense, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, if they're on immunosuppressant, there were so many criteria with heart disease, and uh, any comorbid, uh, there was a list of diseases where they would come under that and we would vaccinate them. And initially we begin with Covishield. 
that was from january 16th onwards first it was for the frontline workers healthcare workers and later on we added with uh, more than 45 years with comorbidities and subsequently uh, it was uh, uh, added with uh, without comorbidities more than 45 years so uh, the initially when it began the first dose was given uh, given on the first day and uh, 20 after 28 days they were supposed to take uh, second dose later on they said uh 45 days after the completion of first dose and now it is 84 days of course now we have covered first dose second dose and we have also have come for vaccinating the precautionary dose and in uh, especially in bbmp we are giving precautionary dose for more than 60 years age of more than 60 years and they should have completed 90 days from the second dose now we have three types of vaccine available right now. COVID shield, which is given uh, from 18 plus, and Covaxin we started just recently, which was uh, given for 15 plus also. 15 to so initially we were giving only for 18 plus, uh, 18 plus. Then later on, after the trials and uh, completion of the trial and acceptance, they started for 15 to 17 years. And now, of course, we have started with uh, vaccine Corbivax, which is given between the age of 12 to 14 years, where the child should have born between 1, 1, 2008 to 2010. So now we have done good coverage, actually. The response is very, ours is a population of 54,147, but we have covered the entire population, the entire population in the sense, we have about 36,000 uh, population above 18 years in our ward area, but we have uh, completed that since ours is a floating population as I'm residing very close, accessibility is there very near to the main road. We have covered, we have vaccinated 56,000 odd uh, 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 COVID vaccine, that which includes COVID shield as well as co-vaccine. Around 5,000 uh, uh, the doses of co-vaccine we have given between 15 to uh, uh, 17 and 18 plus about 56,000 of uh, uh, COVID shield we have given above 18 years and we have started with Corbivax which is for 12 to 14 years where the response is, uh, was uh, less initially I think parents themselves were very reluctant uh, what side effects what uh, uh, other things they were uh, after that but now slowly we we we, we are getting a good response for Corbivax maybe uh, because uh, other countries uh, they are uh, witnessing all this fourth wave so they want to protect themselves and uh, uh, boost up their immune system i think they are uh, uh, slowly uh, i'm getting a good response for Corbivax also so uh, uh, we are following according to the guidelines, whichever the government uh, uh, gives us based on that, uh, we are taking care. But uh, we would do a lot of outreach for COVID vaccination also. We used to go to the slum, uh, give them awareness, encourage them and uh, do, uh, 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 prepare an area over there. We have, we have to follow all the... Uh, the standard of our uh, uh, this thing and then uh, it was good uh, the response was good when we go to the nearby uh, center nearby center itself we have uh, covered the schools also we went to the schools and government schools have given very good response some of the private schools also gave very res good response between 15 to 18 years uh, so uh, uh, this was uh, uh, this was the work which I've done and routine immunization. Of course, uh, we do conduct on every Thursday. What Dr. Mishra showed that we follow the same protocol where we give a vaccination like for OPV, Penta, which includes diphtheria, tetanus, uh, whooping cough, then uh, influenza. Then we have started with the pneumococcal vaccine also uh, recently where. Uh, we go, give them at the uh, uh, six weeks and 12 weeks and booster at nine months. So go, we strictly follow the immunization uh, guidelines, universal immunization guidelines. And uh, the same thing we are applying for COVID vaccination also. But 
Hello. Hello. Yes, doctor, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so these are the... Uh, 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 we are uh, we are conducting at uh, UPHC level and outreach. So any information do they want? The students want regarding this? Uh, possibly something that could help them is, is there a way they can come and walk? volunteer for this or uh, you know yeah. some, some See, sort I'll of be very, I'll be very grateful if they come because uh, the response for Corbivax is not so good they are coming voluntarily though we have sufficient vaccine uh, we went for schools also they said school then uh, examination time now they say holidays so some of the schools we could cover government schools private why don't they create an awareness and uh, encourage them to take and protect themselves at least for the coming fourth uh, Wave. Uh, so that help would be of great help for me if they come and volunteer and uh, go to schools and uh, encourage them to take uh, vaccination. So yeah, so this message is out there and loud and clear. So we will see how we can take it forward. And something yeah. else to also discuss, doctor, is uh, uh, yeah. if there are programs that looks at post-vaccine surveillance, which is exactly yeah. what we're doing at Three yeah. Analytics, would that also be of yeah, yeah. because when you provide evidence yeah. to say that there is a wellness check, there is a follow through, uh, that is also yeah, another yeah. possibility to look at collaborative efforts. Okay. So we could do that also. Yeah, I think, you know, that that's a great idea. Let's, uh, let's look at what else could be done. Uh, but over to the next generation. Yeah, I know yeah. if we are all uh, getting ready for the next, uh, you know, whatever, yeah. lunch and classes and everything. So amongst the ones who are here it could even be the yes. facilitators and uh, yes. staff dr raghav uh, if you want to yeah. ask a question and uh, ms uh, Lata also if you could please uh, ask yes. any question on behalf of your students it will be great yeah if they have any doubts any question can they please joshika sri meeting PTM. Ah, I have one. Ah, no. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Sunita, thanks. Thanks for this wonderful webinar. I could see uh, a lot of feminine people, you know, joining hands to promote these activities. Really impressed by this. And I'm sure that our pharmacy students will get benefit of it. Thanks. For, I mean, thanks a lot for arranging this webinar. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dr. Raghav. On behalf of your students, is there anything that you would like to ask Dr. Rajeshwari? She's trying to make it more like a discussion. So, yeah, if if on behalf of students, if possible, uh, if uh, our students can visit PHC and can yeah. see real time, you know, uh, yeah. procedures in the PHC, that would be very grateful. Yeah, I think uh, that is a good idea. Why don't they come and watch and uh, document themselves and see? Isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Dr. Rajesh. We will initiate. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes we don't even, we document mild effects also, moderate severe. Why don't they document, wait and watch, sit for the whole day and document and yeah, uh, they can do that. We are definitely interested in this from uh, yeah. uh, three analytics, from IPA, from, uh, you know, the pharmacy uh, representatives. Yeah. We will okay. definitely uh, talk to you, doctor. Thank you so much oh for making okay, time. You. I know it was a busy day for you. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let them please visit. They are always welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Okay. Rajesh. Okay. So, okay. yeah, thanks a lot. So, I think, you know, we have come to the end of our uh, webinar for today. What would be really great is to see uh, certain outcomes coming from all of these webinars that we are conducting. One is definitely the IPA CPD that is taking the lead in the FIP uh, program, which is about the vaccination, what is the curriculum, what is the training that we need for the pharmacists, etc. So that's something to look out for. So we will keep you informed on that. And uh, the next thing is the opportunity now the students have uh, to visit uh, Adugodi dispensary and assist uh, the program in some way or the other that they can which also means we are preparing the next generation to take on these challenges in a much better manner than our generation took over those challenges and address them. So Dr. Rajeshwari and all the uh, key speakers, 
uh, absolute gratitude for all the time that you have given us. Uh, it will be well invested in the next generation. So thanks everyone. And uh, we look forward to working with you all in one or the other way during the vaccination program. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.